So corrosion. Corrosion is the gradual undesirable oxidation of metals that are exposed to oxidizing environments in the environment, oxidizing agents in the environment. Um, and so we think of this um, most familiar, familiarly, I don't know, it didn't come out well, um, rust, right? Iron rusts. Other metals corrode as well, but iron rusting is, is the biggest problem. So what's causing the metals to oxidize? It's oxygen. Oxygen is great because we need it to live, but it, it also does a number on metals. So oxygen is easily reduced. And so that can bring about the oxidation of other substances. Um, so when you look at the list of um, electrode potentials, the reduction potentials, um, you see that oxygen is above most of the metals in that list, which tells us that oxi oxygen will reduce most of the, I'm sorry, oxygen will oxidize most of the metals. So there are two ways that that can happen. Um, we can have oxygen with water um, that is using two electrons and um, forming hydroxide. That has a standard potential of 0.4 volts. Or if there's acid present, um, oxygen in the presence of acid, you've got four electrons making water, and that's 1.23 volts. So this is, um, this can oxidize, I mean, this can, this can oxidize almost anything. I was told that zinc can like reduce that, like basically, or you know, oxidize, reduce the reduction. Uh, they told me uh, basically when there was something rusting, the paint over it, and like, you know, yeah. And we'll talk about that. Paint can be used to prevent rusting. Yeah. Um, so metals corrode in the presence of oxygen, acid, and water, but they're still very useful as building materials. Um, many metals form oxides. So when they're oxidized, they form an oxide. And that, of course, is going to be on the surface where the oxygen and the water was. Um, but if the oxide that forms is tough, if it's structurally solid and unreactive, then that actually acts as a coating, a protective layer to prevent further oxidation. And that's something that aluminum does. So aluminum forms Al2O3. This is very inert. It's structurally solid, and so it protects the aluminum. So you'll get a little bit of corrosion on the surface of the aluminum, and then it kind of seals itself in, and so it's good to go. Iron is not that way. So you form iron oxides, and they are not structurally solid. They're very flaky, and they fall off, right? And so the, the rust falls off, exposing more iron underneath, and then that rusts. And eventually, it'll just all turn into a pile of, of rust. I've got a car in my, in my driveway that's working on doing that. So what's going on with the rusting of iron? So here we've got a picture of a building, and you see the rust on there. OK, so rust typically begins at some, some kind of a defect in the metal. Um, it can occur anywhere, but it'll typically start at a defect. So here we've got um, iron being oxidized to Fe2+. And this is called an anodic region because that's where the oxidation is occurring. There's not specifically a cell here, but there are anodes and cathodes. So here we have the iron acting as the anode. The electrons that are released um, from that can travel um, through the metal or through um, moisture up here to a cathodic region where they react with oxygen and hydrogen ions. So where does the acid come from? Well, there's carbon dioxide in the air. Carbon dioxide does dissolve in water, and when it does so, it forms carbonic acid. And so you have some naturally occurring acid in the water. Doesn't take much. But that means that we've got that 1.23 volt half reaction instead of the 0.4 volt one. 
So oxygen over here um, dissolved in the moisture, and so then the oxygen is reduced. Um, the iron two ions can travel through any moisture that's on the surface um, to a cathodic region and become further oxidized to iron three plus. And that's where we get the formation of rust. So rust is an iron three oxide that is hydrated. And so there's not one formula for rust. There's different, different forms of rust, so the exact composition is going to vary. It depends on the exact conditions under which it was formed. It's all rust-colored and flaky and not good, but there it is. So any questions about how things rust? Yeah? So in a perfect world, if a metal doesn't have like an imperfection or a damage to it, it shouldn't rust at all because it's plated? Well, if, if the... If the metal was a perfect surface, it would probably take longer for the rust to start, but I think it would still start eventually. It's just um, easier for it to happen where there's a defect. And getting something that's perfect is like really unrealistic anyway. Yeah. So what needs to be there in order for rusting to occur? There's got to be moisture. It doesn't have to be wet or submerged in water, but there needs to be moisture. So even just some condensation or extreme humidity is enough. Because water is actually a reactant in the last reaction up here, where the iron 2 is being oxidized to iron 3. We actually have water involved in the reaction. So you've got to have water, not even just for the charge to flow, but it is important for that too. You've got to have charge moving. If you have additional electrolytes, such as various salts, um, anything ionic dissolved in the water, the moisture that's present, makes that conduct electricity better and speeds up the rusting. So cars rust more quickly in um, regions where the roads are salted. So I grew up in Minnesota where, I mean, <laughs> it's the middle of April and they're still covered in snow because apparently spring is not coming this year. A lot of angry people on Facebook. <laughs> um, but they salt the roads to, to cut down on the slipperiness because it's just, I mean, you guys have no idea. It's crazy. But the salt then gets up on the cars and causes them to rust. And so when I was growing up there, it was a very common occurrence to see people driving around in what we called affectionately rust buckets, right? And you know the quarter panels and the side panels are, are literally rusted through. And then you come to California and you're like, how do they keep their cars so nice? Well, there's no snow, and there's no salt on the roads. But you go to the coast, where the ocean is very salty, and you have this salt mist that just kind of blows in, and that's going to do a number on your car as well, because of the salt and the moisture. Um, the presence of acids also promotes rusting. Lower pH is going to enhance that cathodic reaction and make it go faster. Any questions? So how do we prevent rust, corrosion? This is a big deal, major industry. Well, one thing you could do is, is keep the iron dry, right? It's kind of easier said than done. How do you keep iron dry? Well, one way you can do is uh, do that is to coat the iron. So a substance such as paint um, will keep the moisture away from the iron. If there's no moisture, it won't rust. Now, if you have something that has already started rusting and you paint over it, um, if, if there's moisture trapped underneath, it's going to keep rusting, right? And then that rust forming can actually break through the paint and it kind of is no good. So you want to scrape all the rust off and make sure it's really nice and dry before you paint things. Um, another way is to place a sacrificial electrode in contact with the iron. That's not going to work on your car necessarily, but it works pretty well on iron pipes. 
So an iron pipe, and you have a sacrificial electrode. So this is made out of a metal that is oxidized more easily than the iron. And so instead of iron corroding, being oxidized, this metal will be oxidized. And so your iron pipe is going to be safe until your sacrificial electrode is gone. Then you're in trouble again. Um, the other thing you can do is coat the iron with a metal that oxidizes more easily. So this is essentially putting the sacrificial electrode all around the outside of your, your object. And that's what's done with galvanized nails. So you go to the hardware store and you're going to buy nails. You can buy the, the nice shiny ones, or you can buy the galvanized ones that don't look as pretty because they're coated with zinc oxide on the outside. Well, zinc on the outside. And what happens is the zinc gets oxidized more easily than the iron, and so it corrodes, but it makes zinc oxide, and that is stable. And so then that acts as a nice coating for the nails. Any questions? How do you determine again what a sacrificial electrode to use? Or? Well, for a sacrificial electrode, you're going to look at anything that has um, a reduction potential that is, well, it's being oxidized, so I prefer to think of, you know, my view on that. So if we're looking at the oxidation reaction, so we want the oxidation potential to be lower than that of iron. Yeah. So that will be oxidized first. Once that's all gone, then it'll go on and oxidize the iron. Anybody else have any questions? Um, so now we're going to talk about two of the little inset topics. Um, and I don't, I don't usually go over those, but I think these are pretty interesting. So I'm not going to test you on these, but I think it's good for you to hear about this and see how electrochemistry applies to other things, right? So in your nerve cells, there are concentration cells, and there is electrochemistry going on. So there are tiny little pumps in the membranes of human nerve cells that pump ions through the membrane. So here we've got a membrane. Um, it's a bilayer, a lipid bilayer. And there are pumps that pump sodium out and pump potassium in. Did I say that right? The, the sodium's... The sodium is higher in concentration on the outside, and the potassium is higher in concentration on the inside. And that's because those little pumps do that. So because of the concentration difference, that means there's an electrical potential across the membrane. And that's about negative 70 millivolts. So not real high, but it is significant. And, and they call that the resting potential. So there's this potential difference between the outside and the inside of this nerve cell. When the nerve is stimulated, channels open. So these aren't the pumps. These are the channels. Channels open. So this, um, this channel opens, allowing sodium ions to flow in. The sodium ions are going to come in because they've got a higher concentration out here. So they're going to naturally flow in. So changing that concentration is going to change the, the potential across that membrane. So it's going to rise from negative 70 millivolts to positive 30 millivolts. And that triggers other channels to open that allow potassium ions to escape. And the potassium ions leaving are changing the, the, the uh, concentration gradient again. And that's going to bring the potential back down close to the resting potential. So what we end up with is this spike. So if we look at the membrane potential, here's the resting potential, and you stimulate the cell, and sodium channels open, and the potential jumps up to about 30 millivolts. Then the potassium channels open, it falls back down, it goes down lower than it was before, and then slowly comes back up. And so there's this spike that occurs. What? I said, AKA is the owl. Yeah. 
So that, that spike in part of the membrane triggers a similar spike in a neighboring segment of that same cell membrane. And so that spike in potential travels down the cell until it reaches the end of the nerve cell. When it gets to the end of the nerve cell, we need to keep this communication going. So what it does is it releases chemical neurotransmitters that go from one cell to the other and communicate to the next cell, hey, we're doing this now. And then you get the, uh, the spike in the second cell, and it travels down the length of that nerve cell, and on and on and on. And so this is occurring in your body all the time. And it's electrochemistry. Any questions? Yes? So would this like exist in a form of like equilibrium? Since it's just like the sodium is just passing through this. So is it a spike and then it's rising? Is it just like a spike and it like drops out and then it's a spike? Well, it's the, this, you know, and, and we're just talking very generally about this. Of course, there's a lot more involved in this. But the stimulation causes the channel to open. And then the reason the sodium ions rush in is because of the, the concentration gradient, right? And then that causes the potential to change, which causes the other channel to open, and the potassium ions rush back out. And so, I mean, if I think this is a very interesting topic. It's where electrochemistry and biochemistry come together, and there's a lot luck that can be studied there. Any other questions? And electrochemistry is also involved in law enforcement, right? So a breathalyzer. There are different kinds, but one type uses a fuel cell, which is an electrochemical cell, to measure the quantity of ethanol in your breath. The ethanol in your breath is proportional to the quantity of ethanol in your bloodstream. So the magnitude of the current that occurs in this fuel cell corresponds to the quantity of ethanol in the breath. So the fuel cell looks something like this. And here's the picture of the device. So you have the suspect blow into the end. And so if they have ethanol in their breath, that's going to come in. Here's the anode. and the ethanol is going to be oxidized to acetic acid. And then we've got a reduction reaction occurring as well, and so we get current. So air can come in through this other opening, so we've got oxygen. So here, let's look at this reactions. So here's the ethanol is being oxidized to acetic acid, and oxygen is being reduced. And so we could look at the overall reaction, we're going to have ethanol plus, see those cancel out, and these cancel out, and most of those cancel out. So we've got ethanol plus oxygen forming acetic acid and water. But in the process of that occurring, the current flows, and you read it on a display. Of course, this has to be calibrated, but if properly calibrated, it can very precisely measure the blood alcohol level of a suspected drunk driver. It's pretty cool. No blood test needed. Yeah? Did you say proportional to like, the, alcohol, the blood in the alcohol? I mean, the alcohol? The alcohol in your blood, yeah. So like, I see people like, cool. On TV, it's something like chew gum and stuff. Like, is that like an actual? Does that actually work? Chewing gum to disguise the alcohol in their breath? Yeah, asking for a friend. No, <laughs> that doesn't help. Um, it may make your breath smell better. It may mask the smell of alcohol on your breath, but the alcohol's still there. So, like, would be a way to like already have it, I guess, oxidized. How do you get around? How do you get around it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I really don't know of a way to get around it. I have a question. Because you're, yeah. This. How often does it have to be calibrated? Like, if, say, you were in a situation like that, would it be, I mean, could you, could you be falsely accused of a, of a DUI if it's not calibrated appropriately? 
Would it be better to just go and get a blood test and just refuse to do a field test? Um, I don't, I think they're pretty accurate um, and pretty robust. Someone within the, the, the department is... And I'm sure that they have been picture. extensively tested so that they know how often they need to be calibrated. Okay. And I'm sure they have to keep logs and records of all that. Yeah. Well, I suppose in, in theory you could have some other electrochemical reaction going on to take out the ethanol of your breath, but that just seems awfully involved, right? No. I'm I'm not condoning anything like that on YouTube. No. The the solution is don't drink and drive. <laughs>